Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the Naval Institute, and I am at West. This is the end of day one, and I'm with Sam Legrone, the head of the USNI News team. Uh, so, Sam, we're just going to do a quick recap of, you know, big big themes that we heard today at, uh, at, at West 23. Um, what, what was newsworthy in your mind? Well, I think the big... Um continuing thread since the national uh, security strategy came out has been how do you maintain with the pacing challenge, how do you keep up with the uh, People's Republic of China in addition to all of the other security challenges that the U.S. faces today. Uh, And I think um, what we're really starting to see, and I think um, everyone from Admiral Paparo, who's the uh, uh, head of PAC fleet, to uh, the assistant uh, commandant of the Marine Corps, uh, General Smith, uh, to the most recent China panel uh, that uh, where you had the, the number of fleet commanders come out and talk is the idea that we spent the last 30 years in uh, an era of efficiency yes. when it came to how you develop systems, how you did logistics, and how do you stretch that taxpayer dollar. And I think there's a recognition now, and I think that was kind of a underlying theme but between all of the conversations here was now it's about resiliency. How do you go and have redundant systems and excess capacity to do battle damage? And then how do you do logistics chains that um, can easily be severed? And that's really where we've been um, kind of focusing a lot of the conversation with our coverage is that we're in the, the, the period of a transition here and how that manifests itself with systems and acquisitions and personnel, and we're starting to get to the point where there's some uncomfortable truths that are starting to be revealed. I thought all the conversations were pretty candid, and the, the speakers talked a lot about, as you pointed out, pacing threat. Uh, they talked about, um, you know, just budget caps and, and you know, the, the amazing amount of requirements that there are. I heard General Smith, the assistant commandant, talked about uh, amphibiosity. He talked about the need for organic mobility for the Marines. And he talked about 31, you know, L-class ships and about 35 uh, landing ship medium or the light amphibious uh, warship, right? right? Um, And he, you know, and he he was very candid about the fact that, uh, that, you know, the Navy and the Marine Corps haven't agreed on the number. Um, but that's largely because the Navy's got this also massive requirement to build Columbia-class SSBNs, which are going to be expensive, and, you know, and Admiral Paparo talked about that as well. But, uh, you know, everyone's been pretty candid about, hey, this the pacing threat, we've got to move faster. Uh, I'm curious your take on some of the, you know, the industry aspects. Uh, you know, what do you, are you here, have you talked to anybody from industry or, or perhaps picked up on some threads that, that you think will play forward f- for here, for for the industrial, you know, industrial capacity, and what companies take out of this this event. The amphibious question is something that I think is the one that might be the most unsettled as far as future requirements uh, go, as far as current capabilities and how they kind of mesh in with um, what the Marines see their roles are and what the Navy sees their roles are. Um, I think uh, General Smith said that, hey, you know, we're, we're all in the same boat, we're rowing in the same direction, but they're historically over the last 18 months, 24 years, I mean, this is an old story between the Navy and the Marine Corps, which is how many amphibious ships do you really need? And the Marines always want more, and the Navy's like, well, maybe we need to put those resources in other places. So I think the center of that is what do you need to support these new um, units that were developed as part of Force Design 2030. That's General Berger's, the Commandant's. It's his kind of underlying philosophy and principle of how Marines are going to f- fight in the future. And that's kind of a return to island hopping and having um, uh, things ashore that are inside the enemy's like missile umbrella. So the, the whole idea of a fight in the Western Pacific is predicated on, on the idea that you have the Chinese with this really dense missile magazine and really deep magazine of uh, capabilities that they can reach out into, you know, a thousand nautical miles off the shore of China, plus... ISR. ISR. Yep. Plus, uh, you know, their expanding fleet that's, you know, going to be 400 hulls before we know it. 
So a big part of that, those conversations have to do with, well, okay, so this is sort of the threat that we're facing right now. How are you going to go after it? And I think while the Navy is kind of figuring out still what distributed maritime operations look like and how the ultimately what the fleet composition that will go after this threat would be, the Marines are probably a lap, lap and a half ahead in how they're going to fight. And so getting the Navy on board with what the Marines want to do, uh, based on uh, General Smith's comments, are, are going okay. But still, Congress had to mandate an amphibious study for the Secretary of the Navy to, to undergo to see what that bare minimum requirement was. And part of that is going to be these new literal combat um, regiments uh, who have these... The uh, Marine Littoral Regiments. The, the, right. The, the MLRs. M the MLRs. The Marine uh, uh, Littoral Regiments are really interesting because they go and kind of shoot and scoot. Yep. So you take these small uh, landing ship mediums, uh, which are much, much smaller than your traditional L-class ship. So if you think of um, like a big depth, like a Wasp or an America class, that's essentially what we would consider to be a, a light carrier from right. World War II. It displaces about 45,000 tons. Even the um, San Antonio class, the landing platform docks that they have right now, those amphibious warships displace about 25,000 tons. So those are big, big, big ships. Yeah. These um, smaller landing ship mediums are going to much less than that, maybe a thousand pounds. Thousand uh, tons. Not a thousand tons, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe displace a thousand to two thousand tons. And they take, um, you know, maybe a company sized element, battalion sized element. They're still working on exactly what those, you know, kind of requirements are going to be. And then they would go clandestinely, you know, make an island landing. They would have systems, including long range missiles and radars, and they would set up an expeditionary fire base to go after Chinese ships. And then they would go and shoot, do what they need to do, and then leave. And so there's this big debate going on right now is what, what is the risk that you would tolerate for um, these forces that you would go and deploy on these islands? So, for example, um, how do you go and have a ship that's relatively not as well defended as a traditional L-class amphibious ships? or have the air and search uh, radar or the missile, missile protection of a destroyer. And then all of a sudden you have to deal with um, all of these other traditional ideas of safety when it comes to... Damage control and firefighting. And, right, right, exactly. That you, have a lot, size, yeah. that you have a lot of resiliency in a traditional ARGMU or uh, amphibious ready group, MU construct with the three ships there plus whatever destroyers you tack on or a carrier strike group. So that's been a cultural conversation that we've been hearing a lot about is the amount of risk that the Marines are willing to take versus the amount of risk that the Navy is going to take to put a, a ship out there um, relatively undefended. Yeah, I also heard, uh, I think it was General Smith and then General Heckel in the first panel this morning, there was a mention that, that uh, they're talking about each MLR, Marine Latour Regiment, will need about nine of these uh, LSMs, landing ship mediums, to, to move it, right? And they're also, General Heckel said uh, that they're, they anticipate having to move from shore to shore. So this is a capability, they're, they're not anticipating you know, other elements of the joint force helping move the Marines. This is a, a naval integrated capability to move from shore somewhere to shore and then being able to move and scoot and communicate and, and, uh, and manage their signatures as well uh, to, to, to counter ISR, right? So they're, they, they can set up and they can stay hidden or they can, you know, shoot and then scoot fast enough uh, I thought that was interesting. General Smith mentioning that a well-oiled uh, artillery battalion or artillery fire team you know, takes about seven minutes from the time that they shoot to scoot. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, having to get that down so that they can... You're you know, not going to have that time anymore. No. Not, right. not anymore in these. Um, so that's, that's another... Uh, the, you brought up a lot of interesting points. Um, about 10, 12 years ago, the Marines started some really interesting experimentation with a war fighting lab, with uh, mesh networks, and being able to have kind of uh, unit level networks that were independent of satellites or anything else. And that's, uh, that's an idea I think that's kind of permeated throughout the Marine Corps, and you're starting to see it a little bit more in the Navy, the idea that you can go and create these sort of network, individualized networks that don't necessarily have all of the connectivity that um, we'd be used to today from satellite communications. 
there. So that's a big part of the, the kind of the connectivity piece um, and, and that sort of independence and, you know, going back to that idea of, like, I want a Marine on top of me, I want a Marine behind me doing my logistics, I want a Marine, um, you know, next to me if I'm going to assault through an objective. And this, this independence of uh, uh, network idea, we're, we're starting to hear a little bit more about and how that connects to sort of other parts of the joint force. But you're right, there's still that, like, level of Marine independence that is... Uh, been a big part of a lot of these conversations. Yeah, all the Marines I've heard today still talked about MAGTAFs, mm -hmm. Marine Air Ground Task Force, scalable, mm -hmm. right, and, uh, and having that. Uh, what, what does tomorrow hold for you in terms is, of things you're looking for, interviews you're having, the conversations that you want to, you know, or the questions that you want to ask? Um, I think a lot of the, uh, I, th I think we're going to kind of build on some of these larger ideas of fighting in the future, uh, you know, it's not as interesting as a missile shot, but the logistics question is still really big, and I think that's something that's starting to get out there. One thing that we've been spending a lot of time thinking about is uh, ship maintenance and ship repair. Um, so what happens in an a emergent repair situation if you have a ship with battle damage? How do you go and do that turnaround? And so, you know, you can talk about World War II where you have ships aircraft carriers, you know, the Yorktown's a famous example, they got it back out. Um, so what do you do with these ships that are just wildly complex and so much more sophisticated and complicated um, and with so many more missions? Uh, last time I checked, it was, you know, close to more than a dozen individual missions that a DDG has to do. So in addition to, you know, the electronic countermeasures warfare, plus the integrated air and missile defense, plus ballistic missile defense, plus anti-submarine warfare, plus, you know, whatever VDSS ca capability, right. and on and on and on and on and on. So you have all of these systems and all of these requirements, and then how do you balance the repair and the logistics and the maintenance of that? And I think a lot of that underlies with what we heard earlier this year from Admiral Kishner, you know, the, the SWOBOS, on how many ready ships that he needs to go and do that. And so that's that's been another part of the conversation that's kind of carried over from last month, which is... What, how do you go and maintain 75 mission-capable ships? Um, and, and what's that reality? And how can you go and man a fleet that is also facing another recruiting challenge? So there are a lot of um, obstacles that the Navy and the Marine Corps both have to uh, overcome. And so on top of all of the other, you know, sort of material solutions that you have to deal with, there is, there is a massive uh, recruiting issue that um, everyone is starting to recognize as really real coming on right now and, and how do you go and you manage that you know you need 30,000 people a year to make sure the Navy's healthy we started to see that system buckle not break but buckle a little bit during the pandemic and getting that throughput there yeah. you know that job's only going to get harder absolutely yeah I think just about every panelist I've heard and the, the keynote speakers today talked about manpower talked about retention and recruiting and needing more people needing to keep people on longer. General Smith specifically talked about, um, you know, the Marine Corps moving away from its old-fashioned way of thinking about, you know, most of the Marines being under age 21 to now, after they've done their four years, we want to keep a lot more of them, right? And so, you know, convincing those sergeants to re-up for another four years, um, yeah, that, that's uh, that's definitely part of the challenge, and part of the conversation. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, well, Sam, thanks for being with us today, and thanks for the wrap-up on day one, and uh, we'll be back again tomorrow. Great. Thanks All right. so much. Thanks.